Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another exciting session of digital business webinars. The topic for today's webinar is artificial intelligence and big data for public policy and governance. And to lead the webinar, we have with us Abhik Sarkar, a senior faculty member for data emerging technology and public policy at Indian Business School. He is known for his expertise in big data technology. I welcome you, Avik, in this webinar session. And now over to you. Hi, thanks, uh, Niharika. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, and you can see my slides too? Yes, I can see your screen as well. OK, sounds good. So I will, I will start. So, uh, so welcome, everybody. So what I'll be talking about today is, is the use of big data and artificial intelligence in the public policy and the governance sector. Um, there is a lot of use of uh, data science, big data, and, and artificial intelligence in sectors like telecom, banking, insurance for a very long time. Uh, but the use of uh, date, big data and artificial intelligence in the public policy and public sector is relatively on the lower end. So this talk is more to in for people to give a flavor of the type of projects that that people end up doing in these sectors and the type of use cases that are there and type of things that you can learn to equip yourself for uh, positions or opportunities in the public sector. So having said that, I will start uh, my uh, my talk today, the webinar. So uh, if you look at the policy making process, the policy making process starts with setting an agenda, then discussing the policy, which is more of a document, and then the formation of policy, and then comes the money for that policy and the evaluation. But this often takes a long, a long period of say uh, five to 10 years. And by the time uh, the evaluation of a policy is done, it's, it is like about five to 10 years. So what happens is that if something doesn't work in the policy, it becomes very convenient for the bureaucrats or the government people to blame that something in the past had was not working. So uh, because of that, or because of some policy discussion that was not done properly or the policy formulation that was not done properly, which has led to the evaluation happening, uh, eva the implementation and the evaluation going bad. To, uh, to tackle this issue, what we, we propose is that a method of continuous data-based evaluation at every step of the process. And this is where based on the on the framework that you see so if we have to do uh, like feedback at every phase in the process we need some sort of evaluation and monitoring and continuous feedback now we come to uh, what uh, niti ayog has been doing um, and i know that niti ayog has been doing for the the past few years has been on ranking and indexing of states the first thing that we look into is like say the issue of health we come to know about the status of health in the country at a at a very far-fetched interval of say of say 10 years. So we have a national family and health survey, which I used to happen at an interval of about, about every 10 years. This uh, since the interval is so large, so it, it deters people from uh, from doing improving their services or or the service delivery on the ground. So to move from there. What Niti Aayog has done is that um, they have come up with a health index of the states in which the health as the, the crucial aspects of health and the health administration in the state are measured on a yearly basis. And this is called the health index. Things like this, there are the index for education, which, uh, which um, evaluates how the education standards in the schools and in the states are at the district level on a yearly basis. Or what is the status of water management? which is also a very important factor. What is the status of water management in the in the states? And, and that has been evaluated on a yearly basis. And this is given as a feedback to the bureaucrats and the officials so that they can um, see what the areas that they're lacking and improve upon them. From there, we move to the sustainable development goal. Sustainable development goal, India as a country, is uh, answerable for the achievement of the sustainable development goal. But India as a country can only improve if the individual states 
also perform well on the various sustainable development goals. So there's a SDG index on which the various aspects of the sustainable development goals are evaluated yeah, and, and they, are, they are measured. The next one is the innovation. Uh, so innovation is very important because if one wants to continue doing business, they need to have an innovative society. They need to be a good uh, number of human capital, good education for the people. So innovation index is a, again, a lot of this have a global index, like there is a global innovation index from which uh, India has improved about 30 points in the last five years. To improve further on that, the states needs to improve for India as a overall to improve in the global innovation index. And this refers to us that this sort of um, ranking like the of this nature was started a long time back. So if you see the ease of doing business, the first year when it was done, um, it was done. Um, we saw the, the normal states like the usual states in business uh, transparency, like say Andhra Pradesh, Gujarat, Maharashtra come up in the top five. But by the, the third year, we saw like states like Jharkhand coming up in the top five. And this was because there was a clear indicator which was provided about where are the areas that they're lacking and where, what are the aspects that they can improve upon, which provides a very easy framework to improve and to improve on these rankings. Often we see that just performing at a state level is not enough because there are certain districts in the states which are lagging behind. So there is a program for the evaluation of the district hospitals, uh, which Niti Aag has been embarked upon. Uh, the evaluation of the municipal and civic bodies, the municipalities and the corporation bodies, and evaluation of these bodies to about how they are doing. And then the ease of living. Each district is evaluated to see how each this the ease of living in each district is, and based on which they are given a ease of living score. And then uh, you have the flagship aspirational districts program, where all the districts in the country were taken for a targeted program and the bottom 115 di uh, districts were taken into a targeted development program. Here we are uh, actually monitoring the progress of the districts not only at a yearly level but actually on a monthly basis and you can see the aspiration districts dashboard as you can see in this uh, this slide his life champions of change at all. You see a, a district called say uh, Dhubri in Assam. You see how the composite score for the district has moved, how the how the different score for the different factors like the health and nutrition has moved, how the different factors for education has improved, how the agriculture and water resources has has moved, how the financial inclusion has moved, and you can see there's the overall ranking that is given to this. Uh, to this district. So, the, so all the aspects of that district is measured on a central framework and then uh, this gives a very good indication about how this is done and, and how this has to be done. So this is a very good because if you see in the in the past the evaluation was happening only at an interval of 10 years moving from there to a um, to a framework where we are doing the evaluation at a monthly level is really phenomenal. But this sort of concept is not new. We have the CM dashboard, uh, which was started by uh, Chandrababu Naidu when he was uh, the chief minister of Andhra Pradesh, where we are measuring a lot of aspects of the state on, on, our, on the chief minister's dashboard, as you can see here. And the CM dashboard provides a complete uh, overall view of that uh, dashboard on various aspects, like say, how many street lights are on, what is the money in the CM's relief fund and things of those nature. Moving from measuring data at a normal level, we are moving to the big data aspect. Here I have just shown you what the traditional ways in which big data is generated. Uh, either it gives a data at huge volumes, variety, either structured data or non structured data, both textual data or voice data or video data. Data being generated at a huge velocity. And then there's the issue of trustworthiness and cleanliness of data, but the veracity comes in. I want to take you from here to the incident that happened in Kedarnath in 2013. There was a disaster that happened in 2013 in, in a large avalanche had come in 2013 in Kedarnath. This was um, 
one of the worst avalanches that took place in Kedarnath in about 100 years. And the day this event happened, what happened was that there was about hundreds of rescue teams which were working there. There are these uh, people in the uniform, then people on the ground doing several um, active, active, active groups like the NGOs and other people trying to rescue people from the affected zone. But one question was on everyone's mind. How many people were there on the day of the incident and how many have we managed to save till now? And given that this uh, place was not accessible after the avalanche has taken place, no one could just go and, and collect data in this traditional way by say uh, doing a survey and asking or counting how many people were stranded there. So uh, a very innovative approach was, uh, was done using uh, big data and what was done was that all the telephone operators were uh, were called and and all the mobile phones that connected to any of the mobile operators in the affected zone any of the base towers in the affected zone all those mobile uh, numbers was taken along with their emi numbers and this was formed the initial list of people who would have been affected on the day of the incident and then um, once any this number was becoming active from a zone outside um, the affected zone, then a call was being made to them by the call center to ask them whether they had actually um, reached their home safely or not, and then uh, collect um, information about their family and their well-being. And this activity was continued till about uh, the next 10 days by which time a large majority, 95% of the people who are there on the list has actually gone back safely to their home or they're in some, in some safe camp. This is a, a very good use case because without big data, this problem couldn't have been solved. And this data was lying idle with the telecom operators for some other purpose. And this was used in a very innovative way to solve a business problem that was there, a very important governance problem that was there in saving lives of thousands of people. The use of big data by the by the government authorities is not um, is not a new uh, phenomena. If you see, there was this um, uh, this uh, economic survey in 2016 and 17, where um, they tried to use the unreserved train. Uh, uh, ticket data uh, to estimate how the internal migration is happening. Internal migration is basically when people are moving from one place to another because for better livelihood or for jobs. So internal migration, measuring internal migration is a, is a real challenge uh, because people are on the move and you really cannot uh, measure where they are or where this location they are and or not. And it also conjectured that uh, people uh, move to the cities in the non-agricultural months and in the agricultural months they go back to the villages for doing farming. So a lot of these trends and studies can be was captured and studied using the you know, economic survey and the unreserved train ticket data that you see here. Another interesting use case that you see here is uh, that was done in the economic survey in 2017-18 was to measure the effectiveness of tax collection of the uh, municipality and the corporation. So two cities were taken, Bangalore and, and Jaipur. And um, using satellite image like that you can see on the screen in front of me, the, the number of houses was what was counted and measured. And they also estimated if it's a high rise building, then how many individual flats are there, this sort of techniques are there, available using satellite imagery. And from there, they draw a list of total number of houses that are, that should ideally be, be paying taxes or property tax. And then they go on to the municipality and the corporation on the, on the other side and see how many houses are actually given, uh, paid their tax. And you can do this analysis at a, at a sub-location level, at a pin code level, at a mohalla level, 
to understand like which area the, the tax collection is better, which area the tax collection is less and things of those nature. And you can basically do a lot of operationalizing of your governance activities based on, on this data. Moving from satellite data, um, this is the data uh, from tele telecom towers and, tel and, and mobile phone data basically, pseudo anonymized mobile phone data. Uh, in, in Sri Lanka, this study was done and the red part that you see on the bottom uh, at the left side is the downtown Colombo area and the areas around it um, are, the, are the areas with the residential areas uh, where people are, are there. So you can see during the weekdays, um, the, the red area is becoming redder. That means more people are, are coming to those areas from outside. So they're having more density of people than the normal density. And the blue area, the light blue area, which is lighter blue is becoming deeper blue. So there's more number of um, number of people than the usual one. So you can see like, um, the, the bottom left image you see is the normal density of people that is there because on Sunday morning, you don't expect many people to move because most of them, everyone is home on Sunday morning. Uh, in, in the weekdays, like say at 12.30 in noon, you see a lot of people have moved from those nearby areas and have gone to those um, that red area in Colombo. So you can see here, uh, this sort of mobile uh, phone data, can give you a lot of information about the traffic movement in the city across different times of the day. And such sort of information is very useful for traffic planning, planning new travel routes and things of those nature. Even like if you have a dynamic um, traffic lights, like what should be the duration of traffic lights and things of those nature. A lot of these things can be planned using uh, data of this nature and information of this nature. So there was another study that was done in, in Sri Lanka again. Here what they had done was that they had taken, uh, uh, they had built a new uh, highway, um, the, the green one, which was which people had to pay to, to go through. And people previously people were using the, the road, road that was um, the blue one on the on the left, which was a, the free route, and they wanted to see whether there was an um, uh, increase in the number of people going on the greener route, and even though there was a toll that was involved, and the other thing that they wanted to know was that whether the travel time has improved. So they saw the significant number of people who are moving from the green uh, from the blue route to the green route uh, in the map on the left. And they also uh, saw that the average travel time uh, from uh, from the two points that you can see actually decrease in the new route because cars are moving much faster um, over, over there. So there was about say 10 to 15 minutes of, of, of advantage that you see across different times of the day between the, the time that was in the previous trip, in the previous road to, as compared to the new road. So moving from uh, big data, so that the examples that I was showing you till now were of uh, big data and, and the usage of big data for um, the governance and, and things of those um, of those nature. Uh, but then often big data in itself is not enough and you need to work more with the big data. Uh, say particularly like you need to work with the um, big data to uh, do some analysis and do some prediction on top of it and artificial intelligence becomes a very important aspect um, so it's one of the major uh, thing that niti came up with was a discussion paper on the national strategy for artificial intelligence in june 2018 and this strategy basically talks about some of the broad areas in which there is a need to focus to improve the artificial intelligence ecosystem in the country so one of, was of the setting up of the centers for the core excellence in um, uh, core research and excellence in uh, in AI. And the next one was the transformational centers for uh, AI. The third is the center for studies in technological sustainability. This becomes very important because uh, if you if you look into uh, the the aspects. 
uh, of technological sustainability this um, you know, the societal aspects of ai and the and its technologies become very important uh, when, you, when you look into uh, those aspects so they become very important and then skilling uh, for ai is also a very important factor uh, that you that you see uh, further from there the five core areas of focus in the paper were healthcare agriculture education mobility and smart cities and i'll talk to you about some of these use cases uh, going further the first one uh, that i would like to talk to you is about agriculture agriculture is very important for our country because through it the food security of the people is is fulfilled it is a very important thing to do agriculture the farmers need the seed the fertilizers uh, as a, as an input uh, and just not that they also need water to to irrigate and, and water the the plants that are that are there at the crop often they use electricity and and diesel uh, to to plow the fields and and to pump the water out so diesel and electricity which are the energy sources has a has an important role also in in the agriculture and the crop production uh, transport and warehouse also play the important role because once the food is uh, the the crop is grown you need to take it to the nearest mandi or market to sell it and you also need to ensure you get the best price for the same to get all of this the the farmer needs capital and often that is available in the form of loans they have to ensure that there is a minimum support price uh, for uh, for these things and minimum support price is is very uh, very important aspect that you that you see here that is given for the crops um, often weather plays a very important aspect whether rains will be there or not um, then satellite imagery is these days used a lot to predict the uh, the outcome of crops and this all needs to be communicated to the people on the ground so this is all leading to early warning in the communication system so there are early um, uh, pilots uh, using the top component like using satellite imagery weather forecast and the soil condition that has been done so ai in agriculture is a big thing that a lot of the companies are, are working upon and and working towards those uh, those aspects uh, there the next one is the early detection of diseases in india a large number of people go into healthcare shocks because a particular disease is detected at a very ultimate stage and at that time there is nothing much that they can do the cost of the medication and hospitalization increases a lot because they have discovered or gone to the doctor at the ultimate stage and then they have um, and then uh, the chances of survival also come down so two things that we um, have been working on on for this is the early uh, risk of cardiac diseases which is the ai based model that does that the next one is the early detection of diabetic retinopathy the diabetic retinopathy detection is completely done by a computer vision algorithm so you have you take the picture of an eye and in in most cases the patient will not even see the ophthalmologist when they go for the test so if part of the ophthalmologist job is done by a machine and is and is done by a machine more efficiently that is where the ai comes in and identifies um, the the spots in the eye which are uh, which are be more diabetic and things of those nature and these recommendations are then given uh, to the machine which then works upon upon them so this is a very important aspect that comes into their early detection of diabetic retinopathy and cardiac risk often what we see is that this is something that has been interesting that has been done uh, when a child is born uh, there is the anganwadi centers in the villages i uh, are supposed to measure the weight height and the head circumference often there is so many different uh, workload that these people have they do not get the adequate time to uh, measure this thing the height weight and the head circumference of a baby and in in some of the cases the child might also be crying it becomes a very difficult thing for them to do so they have come up with a very uh, video analytics based uh, technique where they take a 5 second video of the child as you can see in the image and based on that video what is done is that 
the height weight and the circle head circumference of the child is estimated based on that video image and this then directly feeds in so it basically makes the anganwadi worker more efficient in, in doing his or her work indian languages is again a very big area that needs a lot of focus there's a lot of um, development in the english language and we see things like alexa and google home as like day to day everyday equipment that most of our uh, houses has these gadgets but uh, there is a need for developing natural language toolkit in the indian languages too uh, which is lacking so um, there uh, we are trying to work on a um, natural language toolkit for indian languages which will work on the on this various aspect like look at the morphological analyzer part of speech tagger chunker and and things of of this nature for the indian languages so these are some of the, the languages that we are starting to work upon another use case that i will I'll, i'll walk you through is the assessment of road quality using drones so if you look at the road quality monitoring road quality is often a um, a time consuming activity because it needs land surveyors topographic surveyors and report creation and then paper reports that takes a long time how can all this be replaced with some technology and make the process more efficient so um curl analytics has worked on this drone based surveillance and this drone has like uh, three uh, sensors one is the camera that will see the road condition one will see the depth of the of, of the pothole if there is any pothole or any bad road and then other uh, sensor will provide the location uh, of the road so this three uh, components are mounted on the drone that you see there were this trial runs that was done of the drone in in andhra pradesh before the actual uh, measurements were done after the trial run the drone was then flown over the area and this is how the drone was capturing the images once an image is taken by the drone uh, what uh, is done with that image is that um, you can see um, um, the segment uh, in the first the the road the route in which the drone is has flown is just highlighted as you can see in this image just the just highlighting of the road has been done by the by the, by the geo, geospatial uh, system locating where the drone has flown over then you basically use the drone image which are you see the raw image in the top and you use deep learning based segmentation to segment the road from the kacha part and the greenery part and then you uh, you see the road being processed after the road is processed then one does the classification of the road and the road is classified into four types of mm, classification is given into a good road average road mud road and a bad road and also if there are line markings that is also identified so these four classifications are given to the road and you can see there is a probability value for each each one of them that is there so that is uh, then used uh, for the for this purpose and then based on on doing this for a small stretch of the road for every image you can actually get the entire stretch of the road that you can see is the average road with some parts of the road which are uh, which are like uh, um, like a bad road so some parts that are ma that are marked in red are bad and then the rest of them is the average road so the whole road you just fly a drone over it and you can measure the condition and the quality of the image and and things of that nature by just flying the drone and can getting the overall estimates for the whole stretch of the road there's a lot of efficiency measures that are there uh, when you do drone based surveillance in drone in the manual method you can um, cover about 5 to 15 kilometers per day in the drone based method you can cover 15 kilometers per hour the cost here is about 10000 per day here is 7000 per day but in in one day you can do about say 10 times more than what you were doing um, you you are doing you are spending much less but you are doing 10 times more that is where the efficiency come in 
here in the drone based approach the scalability is huge because you can do about say 5000 kilometers per month but the aspect of scalability and automation are not uh, so easy in the um, in the manual method because you have a manual intervention at every phase which is involved so those things are not very relevant in those uh, uh, example in the last use case that i have is the traffic rules enforcement in ahmedabad city it was done with the look man electroplast industries so you can see the stop line violation uh, that we see here the stop line violation uh, that you see on the road and uh, after the project was implemented you see the stop line violation uh, using this um, image of this nature what was done what was the impact uh, before if we had the traffic people were doing about 2000 notices or chalans across 80 junctions in Ahmedabad city after the system was implemented it actually increased to about 1 lakh uh, chalans per day from 2000 it increased to about 1 lakh chalans only across 60 junctions what was done cctv camera based footage was taken the optical character recognition the number plate was identified and number was read and the violation detection was identified and what was the violation detection that were covered here the red light jumping stop line crossing no passenger not wearing any helmet over speeding and the brt lane in amidabad we have a specialized lanes for buses or brt so if any other vehicle is coming in that lane that's a violation so they will get fined for that so that is also covered there so based on this identification automated chalans were sent to people across the city and because of this activity then the number of people who are actually committing traffic violations reduced and you can see it based on the images there so with that i uh, come to the end of my presentation here um, and this basically what i've tried to do is that give an overview about how big data is used and artificial intelligence is used in the public sector through some use cases that I've taken about two, three use cases from uh, big data example and two, three use cases from agriculture, healthcare and governance in the using AI uh, and this uh, and this examples and other examples are all, all published in a, in a book. Uh, with lot other use cases uh, in a book that will come out uh, in the middle uh, later in in 2020 thanks for your attention uh, if any questions i'll be happy to take them um thank you so much Avit. it was indeed a valuable session uh, this is for the attendees uh, you can ask your questions if you have any and by the time you do that i'm launching a poll kindly put in your relevant choices Um, I think uh, we don't have any questions as of now. Um, thank okay, you so much for, uh, for leading the webinar for us. It was great having you here and thank you so much uh, everyone for being such a wonderful audience. Lastly, I would also like to launch another poll for you to share your experience of additional with their webinars and for today's session. 
Okay, sure. Thanks a lot. Uh, we have Shweta Dixit. Uh, she is saying thank you so much for this webinar session, and she's also saying that it was quite helpful. Okay, sure. Thank, thanks, Shweta. So, are the comments somewhere there? I can see them. Uh, yes, yeah, they're, they're coming in the comment section. Oh, okay, okay. I hadn't. Okay, so I would like to end the webinar session. In case you have missed any part of the session or if you have joined late, do not worry. We will share the recording with you over an email. Once again, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Avik, for leading the session. Okay, thank you.